morning. It's, uh, it's Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter, and at the 8.30 service, I came out and said, Happy Good Friday, everybody. It's not Friday. It's definitely not Friday, uh, and it's not Good Friday, but that, that will be uh, this next week. So, uh, good morning. We are in uh, week four of our series, Savage Jesus, and uh, we've been looking at different passages of Scripture where Jesus doesn't seem very Jesus-y, where he comes across as being like really short-tempered or really angry or maybe like a little bit of a jerk, like what's happening in those passages. And what we found is that if you explore and dig down, there's just a lot of interesting stuff just below the surface. Um, today's message is called that uh, Jesus wasn't religious. Jesus wasn't religious. Perhaps you've had somebody say to you, or perhaps you've said yourself something like this, I'm spiritual, but not religious. I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And what a lot of people mean by that is that, I, you know, I believe in something maybe beyond myself. I believe maybe there's something about me that's, that is spiritual, but I, I'm not associated with a particular religious tradition or maybe a church or an institution, spiritual, but not religious. Uh, Jesus actually uh, wouldn't have used the word religious either. Uh, in fact, he, he referenced the spirituality of all things. The Apostle Paul refers to other Christians as being spiritual. Peter refers to other being, uh, Christians as being spiritual. So we see this language throughout the New Testament, actually. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are spiritual and not religious. And that's what I want to actually talk to you about today. But a lot of people would think that look, if you're a part of Christianity, then you're definitely religious. But that's because we have a confused definition as to what religious or what religion actually is. Uh, researcher Karen Armstrong says this, for about 50 years... Now it has been clear in the academy that there is no universal way to define religion. In fact, uh, another uh, religious uh, academic and uh, psychological academic, Andrew Newberg, was a part of a group of academics who met for nine days to talk about psychology and religion. And they wanted to spend the first couple of days actually coming up with definitions for everything, right? So we're, we're starting at the same place. How are we defining these things? So in, this, in the course of these nine days, they actually ended up spending the first six of those nine days fighting over what the word religion means. Uh, I'm actually reading a book right now that's uh, pretty good. I haven't finished it yet, though, so it may end up being bad at the end, so maybe don't buy it. But it's called Cultish, and it's about how cult leaders actually gather a following of people who are just like completely, you know, in all in for their thing. And I'm, I'm reading it because I want to learn how to be a better pastor. And so... Um, that's a joke. And if you're new here, you really need to know that that's a joke, okay? So uh, anyway, it's called cult-ish, and it's a study of, of, these, of, of these words. And it's, it's actually really hard to define what a cult is, just like it's hard to define what the word religion means. And the, the, the cult thing, like you, you, when we think about it, we think of like things like Jonestown, where everybody, you know, moved down to South America, and then they all literally drank, you know, the, the Kool-Aid together and, and committed mass suicide together. We think of that as cult. But this author is in, in, the, in the cultish book is trying to say like, yes, that's a cult, but also anything that has a cult following can be defined as a cult. So she was saying that, yes, Jonestown is a cult, but also Soul Cycle and Peloton are kind of their own cult as well. And so it just depends on how you define the terms. So we need to talk about what religion is then. And for today, I want to at least define it. When I say religion, this is what I mean by religion. I think this is a good definition of religion. Again, the definitions for religion are all over the place, but this is, this is how we'll define it for today. Religion is any system of belief, behavior, and belonging that people use to achieve rather than to receive salvation. For many of us, we grew up in some kind of church or we were handed some kind of religious tradition that was this. It was like, if you want to if you want to be right with God, or if you want to be saved, or if you want to, you know, uh, enter into enlightenment, whatever your tradition was, then you have to do these things. You have to follow these rules. You have to check off these boxes, and that's how you would achieve rather than receive salvation. And this, this really confuses, like in, 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 the, in the scriptures, this confuses the relationship with God for something that you can achieve and accomplish on your own. It confuses those things. Now, we've been doing this for a really long time. We're going to look at several passages uh, with, with where Jesus taught against religion today. But one of the ones, a little bit of background story for you to know this. Um, you know, God set apart the Israelites in the uh, Genesis chapter 12. He said, like, look, the world has fallen apart. There's a lot of sin and people have, have walked away from me, and I want to call them back to me in right relationship. So he called Abraham and set Abraham apart to, to be the father of many nations. And he said, basically, like, your, your people, the Jewish people, the Israelites, they will be my people, and I will bless you so that you can bless the entire world. That was what they were supposed to do. But by the time we get to, to Jesus, uh, the Israelites have been conquered by the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Greeks, the Romans, like, and they are just trying to hang on to their identity. 
So by the time we get to the first century, they are very much trying as best as they can to just kind of like circle the wagons, face inward, hold on to survive. They are no longer thinking about being a blessing to bless the whole world. They're just thinking about trying to survive. And so uh, they, they even did things like if you read through the Old Testament, uh, there's a passage in the book of Numbers where a number of the Israelites in this camp are getting bitten by snakes and poisoned and, and they're dying. And so God has Moses create a bronze snake and this bronze snake is set up on a pole. And then if you get bit by a snake, you can look at the snake, the bronze snake, and you'll live. So God works with people, right? This is how God often works. He'll, he'll do something through his power, but you have to like, be his partner on it. So the, the snake is there with the power of God, but you have to turn toward the snake, look at the snake in order to participate in this. Well, this was very helpful. The power of God helped to save all these people from these snakes. But by the time we get to the book of 2 Kings in the Old Testament, there's only a handful of good kings in all of Israel's history, but Hezekiah is one of them. And by the time we get to 2 Kings, Hezekiah is tearing down all of the idols that have popped up within Israel, that people have started worshiping these false gods and false idols instead of worshiping God himself. And one of the things we learn in 2 Kings chapter 18 is that at this point, uh, they have actually given this, uh, this, this snake a name, Nehushtan, uh, they've, they've started calling it Neheshton, and they started worshiping in it, worshiping this bronze snake and sacrificing things to this, this bronze snake. They've taken the vessel of God's power and salvation, and they've worshiped the vessel instead of worshiping the God who gives his power and salvation. And so he, he breaks apart in 2 Kings, he breaks apart this snake. It would be like if you, someone told you they were really, really thirsty, and you handed them, right, a vessel of water, a, a, a glass of water, and they took this, oh, thank you so much. And they just started to lick the side of the, oh, it's so much better. It's so much better. Oh, it's so good. No, actually, that tastes terrible, and it's quite embarrassing to do in front of large groups of people. So, so that, that's not right. Like, this is, so they're worshiping the vessel instead of worshiping the God who gives power and salvation. And, and it'd be like someone taking it and just licking the cup. And you're like, Josh, that's ridiculous. We would never worship a cup. And I'm like, I don't know. Are we sure about that? Are we sure <laughs> that we wouldn't worship a cup? I don't know. I don't know. So th this is what ends up happening. And so, so what ends up happening is this relationship that they're supposed to have with God ends up becoming a religion, a system of achieving salvation rather than receiving salvation salvation. Uh, Tim Keller, Pastor Tim Keller says it like this, the gospel is neither religion nor irreligion. It is something else altogether. And then he's going to talk about what these two things do for us. This is really important. Religion makes law and moral obedience a means of salvation. In other words, the way you are saved is by, right, acquiescing to a group of laws, or checking off certain boxes. That's what religion does. But irreligion, right? A lot of people be like, well, I'm not religious. I'm irreligious. What does irreligion do? Well, irreligion is no better because irreligion makes the individual a law to self, makes the individual. In other words, when you, when you don't follow any kind of faith tradition, when you don't like have a relationship with God, you can either choose religion, which is check off the boxes, or irreligion, which is like, I make my own laws. I make my own rules. I make my own way. But many of us have been sold that that's the way forward for us have actually found out later on that we didn't always come up with the best rules the best laws. We didn't always make the best decisions. In fact, we talked about this a few weeks ago, right? But this idea that, you know, at 15 years old, 13, 14 years old, you start to think that you, you know lots of stuff and maybe your parents are just idiots. And then you hit 20 and you look back at your 15-year-old self and you think, man, I was an idiot. Then you hit 35 and you look back at your 20-year-old self and you look, think, man, I was an idiot. Then you hit 60 and you look back at 35 yourself and you think, man, I was an idiot, right? So you're always an idiot and you never know it. That's just life. That's just how life goes. And so uh, irreligion says, like, no, I'll make the rules all myself. But the problem is you're an idiot. And so am I, right? We're all idiots. And so we're, if we're just trying to like find it within ourselves, that's not actually better. And that's what irreligion does. It says, no, it's just all within me. But man, we, the, the rules you would have set for yourself 15, 20, 30 years ago are not the rules you would set for yourself now. You aren't any better at this than the religious scribes and scholars of Jesus' day. The gospel then, Keller says, is that Jesus pays the penalty of disobedience so we can be saved by grace. I want to unpack that for just a moment. We're actually going to talk about this subject in great detail on Easter. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you're back with us next weekend. We have a, we, we have a, a, a worship set and a message that I think is going to be really helpful for you, but for anybody you invite as well. We're really looking for it to be helpful, and with the whole room is going to be set up differently. It's going to be fun. Uh, but, but I just want to talk about this Jesus paying the penalty of disobedience so we can be saved by, by grace. For many of us, we were raised in some kind of tradition 
or we heard about Christianity from somebody, um, some of you didn't grow up in church, some of you aren't sure where you are with Jesus or what you think about all this, but for many of us, we've heard a version of Christian faith articulated as God created us, and then we sinned, and God is so angry about our sin that he was going to kill us for it. The wages of sin is death, Paul says in the book of Romans. But Jesus stepped in and took the punishment, the wrath, the anger of God instead. And so the Father could kill Jesus instead of killing us. Again, we're going to unpack this a lot next week. But that's, that's kind of the way that we've been raised. The Bible's actually much, much more beyond that as an explanation. Like that is way, way too oversimplified of an explanation. Here's, so let me just offer another way of thinking about this. God is our creator and sustainer is the, is the Christian viewpoint, is the Jesus viewpoint. And so if you unplug yourself, if you walk away from your creator and sustainer, the natural result of that is death. If you walk away from the author of life, you will die. Not because he's going to murder you, but because like you've chosen to unplug yourself from your life source. It'd be like if you have your, your iPhone or your Android phone and you've got it plugged into a wall, you can use it indefinitely. It's just going to go and go and go. But once you unplug it and walk away, it has a battery and it will start to decrease and eventually it won't work anymore. The picture that we're kind of given, they didn't have a lot of cell phone technology in the first century, but the picture we're kind of given in the New Testament is if, if you're my author, creator, sustainer, and I walk away from you, like I will live for a little while, but eventually Paul tells us the wages of sin is death, not because God murders you, but because you can't sustain your life apart from your life source. So Jesus comes and he takes the sin and the sin is really the us walking away part, right? That's the thing that separated us from our life source. Jesus takes all of the sin upon himself, and then God pours his wrath out, not on Jesus, but on the sin that Jesus takes upon himself. And so yes, on Jesus as well, but it's not he's so furious at Jesus now, he has to kill Jesus. It's like he is pouring his wrath out on the sin. And why? Because God hates sin. Why? Because sin is destructive. Sin is harmful to you. Sin has hurt you. When people have betrayed you or stabbed you in the back, or cut you loose with no good explanation, when people have lied to you or taken something from you, God hates that because God loves you. So of course God wants to pour his wrath out on sin because sin is harmful to what God loves most, you. So that's what Jesus does. He takes all that harmful stuff upon himself and he lets the Father pour his wrath out on the sin that he now has upon his shoulders. That's not religion, and that's not irreligion. That is grace. And that's the gospel. It's, it's a nutshell version of the gospel. There's way more to it than that. But it's what we need to understand that Jesus came to teach about. Now, when Jesus comes to teach about this and then actually perform it, right, to die for, for us and raise from the dead, defeating and destroying sin once and for all, he, he does this as a Jewish man born to Israel in the first century. And by that point, like we mentioned earlier, like Israel had very much decided that it was going to be a blessing mostly to itself. We're God's chosen people. We're set aside. Everybody else is against us. We're here with Roman occupation, and we're just going to kind of like try to bunker down and make it work. So by the time Jesus shows up on the scene, there are five, at least five major group identifiers that they share with each other that really kind of prohibit them from going outside of Israel to be a blessing to the whole world like they were supposed to. So here's, here's the five. First of all, it's the Torah, the Hebrew Bible, the scripture that they had that was given to them. Now it was supposed to be for everybody, but to them, but they just kind of took it and they kept it to themselves by the first century. They've been very much turned inward. Their religious leaders have anyway. There's the tradition, right? The oral tradition, not just the written, but the oral as well. This is later written down a couple hundred years later in a writing called the Mishnah, but this gave additional laws and understandings of the Torah that would be passed on through oral tradition in the Jewish tradition. Number three is tribalism, good old-fashioned tribalism. And this is true whether you're a first century Jewish religious leader or a 21st century fan of the Los Angeles Lakers, right? Good old tribalism, like, are you with me or against me? And for them, it was, it was also, had, there was an ethnic piece to this too, right? Like, we're, we're together. Uh, territory, literally, there was, a, there was a, a lock into this piece of land. We were promised this land. God gave us this land. And then the Babylonians and the Syrians and the Greeks and the Romans, they came and tried to take this. This is our land. We don't want to share it with anybody else. Now, again, this land was supposed to function as a home base for them to bless, bless the world. But after a while, you start to just get territory. No, it's just mine, right? And amongst their, some of their religious leaders, that was the mindset. And then the temple. They believed that God was everywhere in the world. God was omnipresent. But that God's presence was especially concentrated in their own temple. 
This is why when the temple is torn down during the you know, days of the Babylonian exile, it is, it is a major, major hit to them as a nation. And when they rebuild it, but the second temple isn't as good as the first one was. It's not as big. It's not as grandiose. They, they mourn with grief when they actually see it, those, those who have been brought back to the land. So these, these five things, these are very much identifiers that they have. This, this, is, like, this is our identity. This is us. And we're just going to hold on to it ourselves is, is the mindset of many religious leaders in Jesus' day. But this is not what they were created for. This is not what they were set aside for. This is not why they were blessed. They were blessed to be a blessing. They were set aside in order to pull other people into relationship with God. But by the time Jesus shows up, many of them have forgotten that. It'd be like if you went to a party and there was a DJ and he was really good. Headphones on, all these, you know, get the whole board laid out in front of him. He's like, he's, he's partying and dancing. It's, it's fun to watch somebody who's good at what they do, like do the thing when they really enjoy it, right? And so he's just, you know, he's records and moving dials and like, yeah, it's a party. But he forgot to plug in the speakers for everybody else. Okay, and so everybody else is just standing awkwardly in the room looking at him, and he's like, yeah, so yeah, you know, that, that's like, okay, you're not actually here to just entertain yourself on a stage while the rest of us look at you in awkward silence, right? That's not your purpose, but it would be that kind of feel to it. Or if, or if a friend of yours got a job working for the U.S. Postal Service, and you're like, hey, good job on those benefits, man. Well, well done. And they're like, yeah, yeah, look at my awesome mailbag. And they show it to you. It's like the first day of work. Like, look at my mailbag. Got all these letters here for people and these packages. You're like, wow, that's amazing. It's 10 a.m. Why aren't you delivering that, that stuff? And like, well, I don't want to deliver it because then my mailbag would, would shrink down a little. It wouldn't look as cool, right? This is, this is my mailbag. I really like the way it looks when it's full. Okay, but that's not the purpose of the mailbag. It's not just supposed to look cool. You're supposed to deliver the mail. Israel wasn't set aside for the sake of being special, unique, and set aside. They were set aside to bless the world. But by the time we get to Jesus in the first century, they have forgotten about this expanding relationship with God they are supposed to pass on to the world. And it's become a religious system that they use to protect their own ethnic and cultural identity. So Jesus, from the very beginning, starts to poke at the religious system. The very first miracle that the Gospel of John records Jesus doing is turning water into wine. Probably your favorite miracle, certainly one of mine. He goes to a wedding party, and the wedding party, uh, it's not clear, by the way, some scholars believe that his mom is there. Some scholars believe his mom may have been at the wedding party in order to help out with the party. Like she may have been like catering, basically, like come and provide some of the food or some of the drink. Because she goes to Jesus and she says like, hey, they're running out of wine at this multi-day wedding party. And that was a big no-no. But why is it her problem? Well, it may be her problem because she might be the one who's supposed to provide some of the catering for this. It would be a part of running the party. So she tells Jesus to fix it, basically. And he's like, mom, it's not my time. I'm not going to do it right now. And she's like, just do it. She looks at the servants and is like, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And she just walks out of the room. Anyone else have a passive aggressive mom who was like, you know, we're just going to just, you know, he'll he'll do it. He'll do it. You know, she just walks away. And like a good Jewish son, he decides that he will do it anyway. So he calls the servants over. Uh, Some of them apparently dressed as British soldiers. I don't know what that's about. So he he calls them over and he tells them to gather these jars. So these jars, and they would have looked something like this. These, These jars were like 20 to 30 gallons jars But they were ceremonial, ritualistic jars. The Pharisees, the religious leaders of their day, would fill these jars with water, and they would bless these jars, and they would use these jars to wash their hands in to be ceremonially clean and pure. Now, the party's about to be out of wine. There are wine bottles, jugs, wine skins. There's other vessels he could have used to put the wine in, but instead, he has them bring him these ritualistic ceremonial jars to do it instead. These held 20 to 30 gallons a piece. These would have made something like over 3,000 four ounce pours for the guests. This is quite a wedding gift, okay? And he turns this water into wine in these jars. He could have used something else, but he chose what could have been perceived as the most offensive vessel he could have chosen. Why? Because the very first miracle of Jesus is taking something that within a religious tradition was used for personal purification and changing it into something that's used for relational celebration. And in doing so, I assure you, people were offended. What's he doing? He's poking at the religious system. Now, this isn't about personal purification. This is about relational celebration. He's poking at it. 
A few chapters later, John tells this story. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? A couple things about this. First of all, there's a man who's in clear need of help, and the first thing the disciples want to do is have a philosophical discourse, probably within earshot of the man, about why it is that he has this horrible malady. We don't want to help him. We just like to understand it so we can go and get lunch together, right? It's, like, like it's, it's not a great look. So then there's also this assumption, right? There must be a reason that this happened. It must be because of, you know, he's been blind since birth. It must be because of his parents' sin or perhaps for his sin. I don't know how much trouble one can get into in the womb, but they think that either he sinned in the womb or his parents committed some sin, and therefore this is punishment. Nowadays, we would actually have a name for this. We would call it karma. Lots of people believe in karma. You do good things and good things happen to you. You do bad things and bad things happen to you. I don't know if you follow the news, but there are a lot of people who do a lot of bad things that never seem to have a lot of bad things happen to them, right? There are a lot of good people that do a lot of good things that never seem to have a lot of good things happen to them, or at least a lot of bad things happen to them. But, but in addition to karma being like almost objectively falsifiable because we see everywhere that it doesn't actually work out the way that you hope it will, karma actually has an insidious dark side to it as well. Historically, many traditions that have believed in some type of karma have believed that if someone's in trouble, they're blind in this case, right? Or they're in poverty, or they're lame, can't walk, or they can't speak. If someone's in trouble, they deserved it. And so you shouldn't help them because they're only getting what they deserve. Maybe they'll do better, and in the next life, they'll come back and have a better life. Karma actually has a really insidious underbelly to it that we don't normally want to talk about because it's a little awkward. But this, they're basically asking him a question that assumes some type of karmic propensity to the universe, right? Like, why is he born blind? Is it because of his own sin or his parents' sin? So Jesus has to explain to them, neither one of those are the case. It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. By the way, this verse, this happened so the power of God could be seen in him, very difficult to translate from Greek. Some translations have it said like, but, but let God be glorified. In other words, what this verse is not teaching, it's not teaching that this man was born blind so that this miracle could happen. It seems to be teaching that because this man was born blind, like he is blind. In a fallen world, bad things happen. People are sometimes born blind. People are born with all kinds of maladies. But in a fallen world, let God be glorified by healing it. So the power of God can be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus is setting up a miracle, and you know his disciples have been walking with him for a while now, and they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> right, right? He's like, like hey, this, you know what's going to happen? God's going to be glorified in this, right? Because while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, we're going to see it, man. So they all gather around. They're excited. What's Jesus going to do next, right? Sometimes he just speaks it. Sometimes he touches the person. Sometimes he tells people, like, long-distance miracles, like, go home. Your servant's been healed. But he's miles away. Yeah, I did that, right? Like, like sometimes it's all that. Instead... Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. Gross. That's gross. That's gross if it's Jesus. That's gross if it's my wife. That's gross if it's any of you. Like, it's, that's just gross, right? You know, they're like amped. They're excited to see this miracle. Instead, he picks up dust. He's like, <laughs> what are you doing? He starts to rub it together. What is that? Is he, man, he needs to get more sleep. Like, I, we've, been, we've been doing a lot of this traveling. He probably just needs some time. Walks over to the guy, right? He's like, no, no, he is not going to put that on that guy, right? And he doesn't just, like, drop it on the shoulder. Like, he puts it on the guy's eyes. You just imagine them all being like, oh, right? Like, what are we doing here? Then Jesus tells the blind man to go wash himself in the pool of Siloam. Now, what's interesting is that this story takes place during the Feast of Tabernacles. Lots of Jewish people from outside of Jerusalem would have all been packing into the city. And this story also takes place on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, there was an oral tradition that you were not supposed to heal anybody, right? And so this included if like, you were a medical worker. If it was life or death, you could. But you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath. You're supposed to keep the Sabbath day holy and set apart for God. Just as God set Israel apart, you're supposed to set the Sabbath day apart. 
Jesus sees this blind man on the Sabbath, heals him on the Sabbath, and then sends him to the Pool of Siloam, which during the Feast of Tabernacles, they would have on a daily basis been going down to this pool and drawing out water for it for religious purposes by the Pharisees and the high priests there. So this man is not only being healed on the Sabbath, he's supposed to rub it in the face of all the religious officials on the Sabbath. He goes and gets in the pool himself, comes up, and he can see. So they bring him to the Pharisees because it happened on the Sabbath. In verse uh, 13, and they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. What do you think the Pharisees say? Wow, that's so awesome that you got healed. Nope, not what the Pharisees say. They're furious. Not only did Jesus heal a man on the Sabbath, but you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Remember that rule? He also made clay out of dirt and his spit. In other words, he didn't just break one religious rule. He healed the man in such a way. And remember, he didn't have to do it this way. He could have said it out loud. He could have touched the guy. Could have done any. Could have long distance, right? Hey, go long. Go long. I'm going to hail Mary this thing. Like, you're healed. Like, he could have done all kinds of ways. Instead, he decided to do it in one of the most insightful ways possible in that he incited them. So then he tells them to go wash in the pool. This is something like an artist's rendition of what the Pool of Siloam probably looked like, and he does that probably in front of all these religious leaders. What sorrow awaits you teachers of law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, he, he tells them later. Like, like Jesus essentially heals the man on the wrong day, in the wrong way, and in the wrong place. Do you wonder why they killed him? It's not that Jesus was misunderstood. It's that Jesus was intentionally poking at their religious systems constantly. He knew where this was going to end, but he had a point to make. That these religious systems cannot save you. And so when he's talking to the Pharisees, this is, a, this is in Matthew 23, when he's talking to the Pharisees and the religious leaders and teachers of his day, this is what he has to say, and this is where Jesus gets super savage, right? Jesus has the harshest words for the religious leaders of his day. And here's, here's what you got to know, too. These, you know, if you've been in church a while, you may have read about Jesus complaining to the Pharisees or about the Pharisees. And so you may think, Jesus, good guy, Pharisees, bad guy. And so you come into this, you're like, yeah, the Pharisees, they were the worst. That is not the way that they were thought of in the first century, okay? In the first century, the Pharisees were revered amongst the Jewish people. These are our religious leaders. These are the people who get it. They, they understand, they follow the traditions. They love them. It'd be like if I stood up here today and I did five minutes on how terrible an artist and musician that Taylor Swift is. And I just went on and on right? Like one of the most beloved musicians in all of the U.S. And I was just like, Taylor Swift's the worst. You'd just be like, why are we doing this? Like, why is he sharing this very strange opinion? 25% of you would love it, by the way. You'd be like, yeah, get her. You know, but, but like 75% of you would just be very, very confused. This is what Jesus is doing. He's going to people that all the Jewish people revere pretty much, and he is going after them. And it would have been shocking. So try to put yourself there in the first century. Imagine what it would have been like to hear him going after them. I don't even, he spit so much fire, I didn't have time to include every verse in chapter 23 here. We're going to look at some of it, though. This is what he says to them. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves, and you don't let others enter either, right? Why? Because you're so involved in the religious tradition and system that you don't have the relationship with the God who gave it to you. You've confused the vessel for the power and the relationship. He goes on, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites, for you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell you yourselves are. Why? He's basically saying this, like, look, you go and you try to proselytize. You try to let people know what they should do, but you're wrong. What you tell them is wrong and misguided. So they're worse off than they were before because you've attached them to achievement instead of attaching them into what they receive. You've attached them to religious systems instead of attaching them to a relationship with the God who created them. They're worse off than they were before because they think they've found the one true solution, but the solution you handed them is wrong. He goes on. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. A tithe is just taking 10% of what you have or what you grow and giving it back to God. And the Israelites were commanded to do that, and the Pharisees did it, and they did it with other people watching because that's the thing that people can see. 
Watch all that I'm bringing to God. See how holy and righteous I am. He said, hey, it's good that you tithe. You should do that. But the things in your heart that people can't see, how much justice, mercy, compassion, love you have, yeah, you've ignored that stuff because it's harder to do and people can't see it. He goes on. Blind guides, you strain your water so you won't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. This is stand-up comedy, Jesus. This is Dave Chappelle, Jesus. Okay, this is like, like this is funny. You strain, it, you strain your water so you won't get a nap, but you just willfully swallow an entire camel. Right? You make it look like you're good, but on the inside, like, what you're doing is so, so, so much worse. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites. For you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee. First wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. Last week, a friend of mine sent me an article about a church leader from a very large church in Texas, a state I grew up in. And it was a leader who I've, I've been aware of uh, for, for years, who apparently was living kind of a secret life and doing all kinds of horrible things behind the scenes. And it was a reminder that I get an article like this sent to me probably every few months from somebody. Like, like it is a very common tale that someone will do a great job of presenting as a very spiritual person only to find out that there was all kinds of darkness locked away inside of them that they hid from the rest of the world. It's, it's not a new problem. It's a real problem. It's not a new one. And what Jesus is saying is you Pharisees are doing the same thing. You put a ton of energy into making your outward appearance look great, but the inside of you is filthy. It's stinky. It's dead. If you put the same amount of energy into actually connecting with the real God and having him transform you from the inside out, your outside would be clean too. But instead, the easier thing is to just try and polish up the outside while the, outside is, while the inside is dead. Some of you grew up in some type of religious tradition that was predicated largely on guilt and shame. Like there was a list of stuff that you had to do and if you didn't do that stuff, someone was going to be mad. It might be God, it might be the priest, it might be the pastor, it might be the uncle, the grandfather, the parent. Like someone was going to be mad. You got to check this stuff off, though. This is what it means to be a Christian. You know, we go to church this many times, we pray this off, we do all these things. Like you grew up in a tradition where the, the relationship was really, really underemphasized. Why? Because relationship is messy. Inner transformation is messy. That stuff's hard to talk about. It's hard to, it's hard to quantify. And so what they handed you and said was a system and if you would just work the system, then you could achieve the salvation. Jesus has been criticizing that now for 2,000 years. It's not about achieving, it's about receiving. It's not about rules, it's about relationship. It's not about checklists. It's about checking your heart with God. That's the way forward. And so if, if you grew up in a religious tradition where it was like, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this. It was all about rules, 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 rules. Guilt, 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 shame, 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 shame. If that's the tradition that you grew up in and you decided that you couldn't do that tradition, you needed to walk away from that religion, good. Because religion is not what Jesus came to give you anyway. He came to make you into a spiritual person. He came to give you faith in a relationship with God came to help you transform yourself from the inside out. That's what Jesus taught, and religion is what Jesus fought. So my hope for you is that you might give, like if you've been kind of on the outs with Christianity, you might give it another chance. And it's not that like that means that we don't do anything. I think the whole idea of like, oh, I'm just spiritual, I'm not religious, so all my spirituality is just inside, and I go off like, look, that is a dead end, I got to tell you. Lots of people find that that's a dead end. But Christianity is not predicated on rules. It is about relationship, and it is about an inner transformation. So, so that means that we still do lots of things that look religious. We still gather together on the weekends. We still pray with each other. We meet in small groups. We share meals together. We have rituals like the Lord's Supper that we practice. Like, like aren't those just rules? No, no, no. Here's the reason why. Because we don't think that those things save us. We don't think that those things are something that we have to do to achieve something. We believe that we don't have to do those things. We get to do those things. 
like the reason that a lot of people find it helpful to be here most weeks is because like of what they're getting out of it and the connection with God they're getting out of it. It's not because they feel guilty or ashamed or whatever. Like this is just like if you want your life to be really different and really transformed, like you, you know that there's some stuff inside of you that's broken and messed up and needs to be fixed. Like if you realize that about yourself, then if, if over the next couple of years you were here most Sundays, you decided to do Rooted here, it's one of our discipleship uh, experiences that you can participate in. You were here on some worship nights, you began to take the Lord's Supper, you got baptized. Like, if you were to commit yourself to doing that pretty regularly over the next couple of years, you would be a very different person at the end of those couple of years. You would like who you were more because you realized you would be living more into the person you were created to be. But not because you followed rules, because you took the time to reconnect with your creator and sustainer. You get to, you don't have to. So that's the invitation for those of you who are, like, have, like you've given up on religion. Great, good for you. Just don't give up on relationship with God. Uh, for the rest of us who maybe not be in that spot, uh, I just want to help you avoid Phariseeism, right? The Pharisees, uh, they loved religious tradition in part because it made, them, it made them put down everybody else and puff up themselves, right? Like, oh, we're so good at following these rules, at doing these lists that everybody else is kind of terrible at. And so a, a few things to avoid Phariseeism, and then we'll be done. First of all, beware of an overzealous faith. A lot of times when we're really, we have a lot of zeal about our faith, it's really that we have a lot of zeal about rules. And um, it's, it's not surprising that at the beginning, a lot of times, at the beginning of our relationship with, with God, uh, we do have a lot of zeal around rules because we're still trying to figure out the relationship thing, and rules are easier. They're black and white. They're easier to understand. So a few years ago, my wife and I went back to Grand Saline, Texas, the town that we grew up in, and a friend that we'd gone to high school with was in town that weekend, too. We're like, oh, we should go to lunch. And so our friend told us that she had recently decided to follow after Jesus, which is great. But because it was a, a, pretty, a pretty new faith for her, she was still trying to parse out what's relationship, what's rules, all that kind of stuff. And so we were just celebrating that at lunch with her. Now, I, I pray before a lot, a lot of meals that I eat, not because I have to, but because I like to use it as a reminder for myself that of God's constant provision in my life. And I, I just think it's great to commune with the Father a bit before I eat something. But I don't, but it's not a legalistic rule. And on that day, we were having a conversation, our food got delivered at different times. So we just kind of started eating. We didn't pray for it. I look over about five minutes after our food got to the table and I realize that our friend has dipped a chip in salsa. We were at a Mexican food restaurant. But she's so stuck on the rule that I have to pray before my meal and we didn't pray that the chip has gotten soggy and the salsa is like coming off the edge of the chip. It's like it's bending over. And I realize what's happened. I'm like, oh, hey, we, we didn't pray, did we? And she was like, no, we didn't. Oh, I'm so glad you said, yeah, well, let's pray. So I prayed for, for the meal. And then she could eat her chip. And I just told her, just, you know, put that one back maybe. That one looks gross. <laughs> and, then, and then we ate, we, we had a great meal. Look, she was still in a place where she was like, the rule is I pray before my meals. I don't get to, I have to, right? That's kind of the mindset that she was in. And sometimes when you become overzealous about your faith, it becomes about about the actual acting out of it and the rules that you keep. And so just beware when you start to slip into that. Here's another one. Abandon the comparison game. Like a lot of times when we start becoming more religious instead of more relational, we start to compare everybody else to ourselves. Like I'm following the rules better than they are, right? But here's the thing. We always grade ourselves on a massive curve and we grade everybody else very strictly, right? Stephen Covey says this. We judge ourselves by our intentions and everyone else by their actions. I have two children William and Jack, 11 and 8 years old, and I promise you they do this. And I promise you they got it from their father. We all do this, okay? All of us do. We judge ourselves by our intentions and everyone else by our actions. I was watching an episode of The Sopranos uh, a few years ago. For those of you who don't know, The Sopranos was a TV show, uh, it was a Christian TV show made by an indie... <laughs> No? Okay, all right. Uh, it's, it's actually a TV show that was on HBO a, a, a few years ago. It's about a mafia boss, Tony Soprano, okay? And Tony Soprano has a therapist. And I would agree, every, I think every mafia boss should have a therapist. If you're a mafia boss and you don't have a therapist, you should totally get one. And so in the show, he sits down with his therapist and he's, you know, she knows to kind of avoid getting into the nitty gritty of the business, right? Because like they're killing people for money and all this kind of like, and so she just kind of avoids that. But as you can imagine, killing for people for money does take an emotional toll on one. And so Tony Soprano begins to kind of open up about that. And at one point he has a nephew that almost, he almost dies. He's a near death experience in the hospital and he thinks he crosses over to the other side for a few moments. But instead of seeing like a bright light and being in heaven, he thinks he feels heat and then he went to hell. And so she's like, well, do you think he, you think that was real, that he experienced that? And he was like, no, no, that, that wouldn't happen. He's not going to go to hell. She was like, well, do you think you're going to go to hell? And he's like, no, hell's not for people like me. 
Hell's for like the really bad people, <laughs> right? You can see in her face, she's like, you're a mafia boss. But she, instead she just says like, what people? And he's like, you know, really bad people like Hitler and Paul Potts, like the real scum of the earth. And then he goes on and he says this, and it's one of the most amazing justifications I have ever seen represented on a TV show. And I'm not gonna show you the whole clip because there are some words in it, but I will do a dramatic reading of it for you. Here we go, all right, so he says, we're soldiers. Soldiers don't go to hell, it's, it's war. Soldiers. They kill other soldiers. We're in a situation where everybody involved knows the stakes. And if you're going to accept those stakes, you got to do certain things. It's business. We're soldiers. We follow codes, orders, <laughs> end. Okay. All right, so that's the. <clears throat> do you see what he's doing now? He's doing the same thing that you and I do every day. At least. I'm not as bad as those people, right? No, Hitler, he's the really bad. By the way, I got to tell you, if you have to go to Hitler to find someone worse, you're doing it wrong, okay? Like that, that's really far you have to go. But like, at least I'm not as bad as those other people. I have reasons. I have reasons for what I do. Everybody involved understands the stakes. We all get it. Like that's the reason. We do that all the time and we compare ourselves and we puff ourselves up because we follow the religious traditions better than those other people and we think we're better and it's us against the world and it's just the same kind of tribalism that Jesus preached against in the first century. If you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this. Don't be Tony Soprano. <laughs> Final thing, make room for other people. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, it's easy to start thinking of your faith as a religious system instead of a relationship with God. And when you start to think of it as a religious system, you start to gatekeep who's in and who's out. And you start to think of it as something that you have to protect. In fact, the longer you're a Christian, the more likely it is that all of your family is Christian, that all of your friends are Christian, that the people you hang out with the most are Christian. Why? Because that's comfortable for you. Of course it is. You have a similar world to you. You have a similar starting place. You understand, you make sense of the world in a similar way. Of course that makes sense. But it's easy then when you're a Christian for a long time and most of your associates are Christians, most of your, your, your close relationships are Christian, it's easy to forget what it was like when you weren't a Christian, when you weren't a follower of Jesus, when you were taking culture's cue and just trying to find meaning deep inside yourself to follow your own heart, to make your own rules in an irreligious way. And it's easy to forget how tough that is. The last thing we want to do is gatekeep Christianity because we are the only, the church is the only organization in the world that exists for the benefit of its non-members. We're supposed to constantly be calling other people into the fold, not to follow a system of rules, but to give their heart and life to the gracious, kind, relational God that Jesus pointed us to. Remember who you once were before you were part of this. And in doing so, perhaps you'll have increasing compassion for others, right? Allow your compassion for who you once were to increase the grace of who you are now. That compassion that you can have for maybe your old self can increase the grace to those who are outside of the fold now. When we start to understand how amazing this relationship is, we start to understand why it was that Jesus went to a group of Pharisees who didn't understand it and toward their viewpoint, he was savage. But he was savage because he loved them and he loved those people they were influencing. And the last thing he wanted them to do was to confuse that with which they could receive for free from God with that which they could achieve on their own merit. No, no, the God who loves you gives it to you freely. That's the gospel, that's Christian faith. That's why we're thankful for savage Jesus. God, thank you for our time together today. And Lord, I just pray that as we worship together, as we leave this place, that the beauty and the gift of relationship with you over a religious system will just be something that our hearts and minds are excited all over again with. Like, Lord, it's, it's stuff that we've probably at different times heard or learned or thought of, God, but Lord, as we see Jesus acting it out in so many different ways, I just pray, God, that over lunch today, as we maybe go to sleep tonight, like our prayers to you are just gratitude for the relationship, the beauty of the relationship you've invited us into. Thank you that Jesus said hard things so that he could get our attention. Thank you that he was willing to undermine existing systems and to give his life doing it because he loved us so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray.